As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest tonight, Brother John F., founder of BrotherJohnF.com, Silver for the People, is here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. Brother John F., thanks for joining us again. Hey, Dunnigan. It's great to be back. Now, you are a historical uh, advocate for sound money and an advocate for the common man. Your The tagline of your website, Silver for the People, kind of uh, begs that question of, why silver? And we've asked this of some other guests recently, but I'd like to pose it to you since this has been a focus for you, is is what makes silver uh, desirable, admirable in your sake? And why should an ordinary person be keenly aware of the benefits of owning silver? Well, silver's always been money up until just very recently. I'm talking in you know the long-term scheme of things. And it, the word for money is, is are in silver are synonymous in 60 different languages. It's just only recently with the era of modern fractional reserve banking and central banks and all of the modern fiat money systems that we've gone through an era where silver has been demonetized. And I personally believe the reason why is because that that's their main vulnerability, uh, just because there's so little of it left. Now, the, the reason why there's so little of it left is because they recognized that they needed silver for its uh, industrial uses. Uh, you know, it's the most reflective. It's the most conductive. Uh, so it's a very, very needed uh, resource. But it's also money. It's mentioned in the Constitution. Um and it's mentioned in the, you know, the first monetary act, and it's defined. The dollar is defined as being silver. So, and it's traditionally always been the people's money. You know, the money of kings has been gold, and the money of merchants and people has have been silver. But uh, the bankers, the banksters, the oligarchs, and everybody who's in power, shadow people have decided that they want to take that away from the people. And uh, as uh, Professor Fichetti has always pointed out, that money ultimately is what people choose it to be. In other words, money becomes what people choose. Uh, if, if people want to use something as money, if they want to – I'm talking about the store of wealth uh, aspect of money. There are a lot of aspects of money, fungibility, et cetera. But – as a store of wealth, if people decide that they want to use silver as money, there's really that there's nothing that can stop them except perhaps a high price. But the main thing that they do is they discourage people, and their primary means of doing that is through price suppression. So silver has had some fantastic runs twice at fifty dollars, but. Uh, based on the fundamentals, of course, it should be worth a lot more than that. But uh, the oligarchs don't want silver to become money again. They can't really stop it, but they can try to prevent it. And so their job is to try to discourage people from saving their wealth in silver, while my job is to try to encourage people uh, to save their wealth in silver. Because uh, if enough people make that decision, then there's nothing stopping it. It's kind of ironic that the mechanism that's chosen to use to to discourage people from purchasing something is to lower the price on it, which is this counterintuitive to to the whole laws of supply and demand and everything. Usually, you'd think that by lowering the price on something, you're going to increase the purchase of it. Oh, in fact, we've heard from Andy Hoffman and from others over the past uh, uh, two years that these record uh, low uh, markdowns in silver from you know recent highs has in fact been accompanied by uh, record breaking demand for silver. Like every January, we hear that that the that the uh, mint is running out of silver again. They can't mint U.S. silver eagles and and so on and so forth. So it, do you see that 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 at least there's a there's a semblance of reality playing out there that that with those suppressed prices is coming uh, record physical demand. Well, there has been recently. I mean, that's a relatively new phenomenon we've been seeing in the physical silver market. Uh, traditionally, uh, people would buy it when it was rising and there'd be a buzz and people would get interested in things like that. And uh, when they did tremendous smackdowns, you know, 
the demand would dry up, people would get discouraged, and people would bail out. And uh, that has sort of changed recently, and, and a lot of the stackers have become value investors. Uh, that's something that we see in the East. I mean, you see the shenanigans they're trying to pull in India in regards to gold and uh, in regards to the cashless society. I think we're going to talk about that topic as well. But, uh, you know, to prevent people from uh, buying something on a fundamental basis, we know that the Indians – if they're if gold is cheap, they're going to buy more. We're starting to see that here in America with silver, but American investors are not really what you would call value investors, the traditional Warren Buffett types that look for something that's low priced and then uh, try to buy it low and sell it high. What American investors tend to do is try to buy trends. So, for example, and that's not without good reason. Uh, you can look at companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, and a lot of the dot-coms. These are stocks that have run up 50, 100-fold. And so there are many, many millionaires uh, who have invested in these and made many, many times th their initial investment. And obviously, the way you identify one of these investments is is the technical chart pattern, breakouts to new highs, a sort of Jesse Livermore type of uh, trend buying. And that works because that's the type of markets that we have right now. Uh, the Warren Buffett type of value investor has worked. It isn't really nearly as effective, of course, because in financial securities, there really is no value. I mean, the stocks are ridiculously overpriced on any sort of price to earnings, price to sales, or di price to dividend ratio. Uh, bonds are ridiculously overpriced when you're looking at the value uh, based on the yield that you're getting. So really, all these people are investors are chasing higher prices. And that's fine as long as prices are rising. But at some point, prices fall. And so most of the silver stackers now have become sort of value investors, fundamental buyers. And that's a good thing in the long run because those are strong hands. Strong hands are investors who uh, aren't going to get shaken out by a lower price, whereas most technical investors uh, keep – certain percentage stops below the price. In other words, if you buy a stock because the price is rising, then when are you going to sell? You didn't buy it based on the value of the company. You bought it because the stock was going up. So if the stock goes down a certain percentage, you're probably going to sell. So that's a good thing. That creates strong hands in the silver market. And if the price goes lower, it's unlikely these people will sell. You mentioned in passing the cashless society, and I really do want us to focus on that tonight. It's something that I've heard a lot of in um, the past decade or so, and I've almost kind of thought, oh yeah, I've heard that, and let's move on, that's not a new story anymore. And the impression that I had originally was it was just kind of a technology phenomenon. It's like, oh, wow, we had the paperless office that Xerox promised us, you know, in the 1980s. And, and then we had, you know, whatever, a wireless uh, Wi-Fi in our home. Okay, so you go from paperless to wireless, and now you go to cashless. Fine, it all just seems to be just kind of mean modern. But just in the last uh, couple of weeks, it's really been starting to sink into my head. I feel like um, it's like when you find out that something's really rotten and you didn't realize it was uh, underneath that shiny new skin. And uh, the if you could just t talk to us about what is so um, significant and severely threatening about a cashless society, uh, just to kind of prime the pump a little bit, I heard a quote from Jim Rickards just today. He talked about how cattle are herded into the chute before they are prepared for slaughter. He said, by analogy, we are being herded into the cashless society's banking pen, ready for frozen accounts, bail-ins, and a dev devaluation with no exit. Uh, can you talk to us about how being in a cashless society really pens you in and limits your liberty? Sure. Well, you have to look at why they're in this situation in the first place. Uh, we have governments in the West primarily that have kept power. They've maintained power by uh, basically buying votes um, and giving away benefits and uh, just being profligate, wasting money. And, you know, we are approaching $20 trillion in the national debt. 
and they've had to push interest rates down to ridiculous lows because obviously if interest rates rose to even reasonable historical norms, they'd be completely bankrupt. Uh, the interest on the debt would take 100% of tax revenues. So the governments have gotten into the position where uh, they're way beyond pay as you go. They're borrowing money just to pay today's bills and and that's a terrible situation. Uh, traditionally, the central banks, whether it's the Federal Reserve or the Bundesbank or others, have at least had some sort of political separation from the government in the sense that uh, they have kind of chided them when their fiscal policy has been very poor and said things like, look, we're not going to keep interest rates low forever be just because you people can't get your house in order. You're going to have to do something and balance your budgets because we're going to have to normalize interest rates at some point. Now, they've kind of stopped doing that. It's, uh, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, do the, do the bankers run the government? Does the government run the bankers? We could go on and debate that. But uh, they're basically in bed together. And so they can't lower interest rates any farther. They've run out of tax money that they can get. Uh, so what they have to do is they have to find a way of taking money that's in the private sector. And one way of doing that is by locking everything down in a cashless society, because it's not that it's cashless, uh, because we already really are mostly cashless right now. Um, most transactions are electronic and most of people's assets are held uh, as a digital entry somewhere, whether that's a stock certificate, bond certificate or bank account balance. These things are really virtual. They're just digital entries. But the issue with the cashless society is the escape valve, because in the past, traditionally, you could have runs on the bank. And if the solvency of the bank uh, came under doubt, then people would withdraw their money. And so they're fearing this because obviously they are insolvent and have been so for quite some time. And they have to eliminate people's ability to get out of that system. Uh, and if all the governments of the world who seem to be in bed together against the people, I would say, are conspiring to uh, set up systems that are cashless that you can't avoid, then they can take a big chunk of private wealth to keep their socialist, corporatist, fascist uh, government tax models running rather than having them collapse. So that it, it's a crisis for funding that they're looking at, and they're just looking at ways of, as a good quote there with Rickards, you know, they're getting ready to fleece the sheep. You, and you mentioned, and I still just want to go through that one more time in slow motion, because I think we've all grown up with this idea that uh, whether you keep your money in a checking account, savings account, certificate of deposit, whether you keep it in a so-called money market uh, fund, the whole idea that everybody has is I can go get my money out of the bank. I keep my money in the bank or I keep my money in my, my, my um, brokerage and I can go get my money if I want to. And because I'm confident that I can go get my money if I want to, I don't want to. I want to leave it there working for me. But people need to just, because this is still, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just really slow, but this one just is just not sinking into me. And each time I think about it, it makes me feel more, more un, insecure. And that is that in a cashless society, when, when they're removing, they've already removed the $1,000 bill, they've removed the $500 bill, they're talking about removing the t 100 and the 50 If they If all we get left with is, is, is just basically coinage with the loss of value. If you think about that, the $20 bill today has like the value that a $5 bill had when we were kids, that kind of thing. It's just, it's just pocket change. If you really, in a cashless society, if you decide, I want to go get my money out of the bank, what are you going to do? There's no money to get. There, there's nothing they can give you. They won't give it to you. So you can't, all you could do is move it on to some other account at some other place, but you cannot get it in your hand. Um, and that's the part about there being no exit. Yeah. And like you said, the confidence, I mean, the word con comes from confidence and it really is a big con. If you want to find out if it's a big con, if you have 
say maybe twenty thousand dollar balance in an account somewhere, go down to the bank and ask to take out twenty thousand dollars cash. Tell them you want to go buy a new car somewhere and you want to get a cash price for the car, or you're buying a, a fancy used car. You're going to have a hard time getting out twenty thousand dollars in cash. They just don't even keep it, uh, keep that much cash. So it's already very very tight, and we have all kinds of AML, uh, KYC, uh, you know type of banking regulations that, uh, you know, the government has strict scrutiny on cash. And they, they want to tell you that the reason why they have those things is because of terrorists or because of drug dealers or because of uh, various shady characters. But we know the real reason is because they want control. They want to be able to lock things down and they want to be able to take more people's money. So, you know the excess are starting to close now if you if you have the bulk of your savings already in physical silver and gold or as i recommend uh some of the cryptocurrencies or bitcoin or some of the others there are new ones coming out all the time um these things are outside of their control and they have to be very very careful about this as this window starts to close because um if people decide that they just want to adopt, uh, say, silver and gold for savings and cryptocurrencies for transactions, uh, what's to stop them? The, they might actually force people into those alternatives, and then they completely lose. So, you know, it's it's my contention that we possibly could be looking at a situation where banks and central banks just simply go away. And I know people think that that's unbelievable that that couldn't happen. But if you told people that the post office was going to become irrelevant and would just simply go away because of this thing called email, or if you told people that all of the newspapers would basically lose all their revenues from classified ads because there'd be this thing called Craigslist. And I could go on with the examples of how the internet and with Bitcoin specifically, cryptography is changing the way the world works. Um, it's quite possible in my mind that they see their window closing and they have to clamp down on things. But like I said, it, it might be the clamping down that actually pushes people out of their system and people just say, forget it. Uh, I'm done with you. I'm just going to live in the um, underground economy using uh, cryptocurrencies and precious metals. Another misconception related to everything we've been talking about is the idea that it, that uh, it's your money in the bank and some laws that were changed just a few years back. Uh, I know most people who are really into this sort of stuff ha are aware of this, but, but most people aren't. And that is that you are a depositor in the bank above what some people have said is a laughable uh, so-called insured limit of the FDIC or FSLIC where uh, there really is nowhere near there's only you know pennies on the hundreds of dollars of actual insurance to protect people against you know catastrophic losses in the, in the banking system but any deposits above and beyond that that you may have in these establishments is not uh, your asset it's the bank's asset and you're just an unsecured creditor of the bank that when you say quote unquote I've put my money in the bank it's not yours anymore, and instead you'd be waiting in line uh, with a frozen account uh, behind everybody else, the, the stockholders and the other uh, secured creditors of the bank, um, the owners of the bank. But worse than that, when your um, funds that you put in there are just showing up as electronic deposits, uh, they're completely subject to uh, th things that you can't control. Overnight changes in either bail-ins or devaluations of the currency or whatever. If you don't have access to your funds and it's locked up, uh, and this specifically happened to us during the 2008 collapse, our so-called money market fund was at was uh, what was called the reserve fund, recommended by our broker. And we did not know until Lehman Brothers collapsed that our fund was, was supposed to have one-day access to funds was unredeemable for a period of years and uh, until that completely got unwound and we finally just got the last piddly uh, uh, check back uh, this last uh, quarter and it, we never got all of our money back um, so your account can get locked up and there's nothing you can do about it and the policies and rules can change and you're just completely helpless at that point uh, is there any other aspect of that 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 uh, you'd like to add as far as people's awareness of what it means to take your assets and, and, and 
basically put them in the bank? Well, I don't uh, don't really use banks for anything, but the you know the transaction. I certainly don't invest in. Uh, if something is a promise of someone to pay, I, I don't invest in it. So whether that be a uh, stock or a bond or a money market or anything else, I, I'm not really interested in somebody else paying me money that they owe me. But as far as using banks for you know everyday transactions, obviously if you run a business or you have employees or you do things like that or just you know you have your average person with their bills, then you're going to have to have some involvement unless you really want to step out of the side of the system and use cryptocurrencies. You, you can. It's hard. But if you want to use a bank or something like that, then you could always just um, have credit cards from that same bank. And um, if you had, a say, a five or $10,000 cash balance in there in your checking account, you could also have a five or $10,000 debt that you owe them in a credit card. They love to give you credit cards and, uh, and say, hey, your money's gone. We just took it and say, well, you just took that credit card. I'm not paying you. So basically, you're essentially keeping a zero balance in the bank because you owe them as much as they owe you. Uh, that's a, another way to approach it. If we could turn, speaking of debt, <laughs> that would be a perfect uh, shoe into our next uh, question about the U.S. national debt. We've heard from several guests over the, over the past few months that it's not just the U.S. debt, but that all of the uh, world uh, sovereign nations are following the same trajectory. China is carrying huge debt. Uh, we know that the various European countries are basically f dropping like flies out of the Eurozone because they're, they're under such crippling debt. African countries in such debt to the World Bank, etc. Um, but the U.S. national debt just passed a landmark last week of $19.9 trillion for the first time, and that's the official debt, not even counting the somewhere arguably between 100 to 200 trillion in unfunded liabilities. But can this continue uh, forever, or what is gonna force an end game? What is gonna bring sanity back to this? Well, it certainly can't continue forever, and I, I don't think it's fair to make comparisons between, let's say, China and, um, you know what we have in the Western countries. Uh, if you look at you know, what we did in the United States in, in the 19th century, um, you know we built railroads, and a lot of those railroads were funded from bonds that were came out of Europe, and a lot of those bonds were defaulted on, and uh, some investors made a lot of money, some investors lost a lot of money. Uh, but ultimately, the United States became very, very powerful, and one of the big uh, keys to that was these railroads that we built. So that debt was used to build infrastructure. Now, if China goes bankrupt tomorrow, who cares? Um, there's a lot of people who won't get paid money they thought they had. But at the same time, virtually all of the infrastructure that China has built will still be there, including unbelievable maglev bullet trains that can go, you know, 400 kilometers an hour and, uh, you know, unbelievable infrastructure that, that they've built. Uh, now, if you look at the West, it's a totally different situation. If all these things are zeroed out tomorrow, what you end up with is a whole bunch of people who feel that they're owed something. In other words, we're not talking about investors. We're not talking about businessmen who made a bad bet, and that's a part of business. We're talking about people who will be destitute because those people are dependent upon other people supporting them. They believe that they made an investment, whether that be Social Security or these pensions, as we're seeing in California with a trillion-dollar pension deficit or in Texas with the police and fire pension. People are panicking out in lump sums because in the West, when this, if this thing goes belly up, or I should say when this thing goes belly up, you're going to have a very, very large percentage of the population who is going to be left expecting to be supported and there won't be any money to support them. So that's a much, much worse situation than the situation in China, which is similar to what the, was in you know the 19th century in the United States, where you just have a reset and you start over and uh, you get back to business. That's not going to happen here. We're talking about uh, a serious humanitarian crisis uh, once the system collapses here in the West. 
what do you see as being the kinds of triggers that would would signal the end of that of this build up and build up? If you look at you know the exponential growth curve, if you look at, uh, they say that the U.S. national debt doubled from the first two hundred years of our country's history. Then under the Obama administration, doubled all. It combined, added enough debt to 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 more than uh, outrun all of the presidents that came before, and some people say that with the Trump presidency, uh, that might happen again. Do you see that? The, how can this redoubling and redoubling of the national debt? And you mentioned earlier the the burden of uh, you know borrowing from tomorrow just to pay today's bills. One of the increasing portions of today's bills is the service on the national debt, even at artificially suppressed uh, interest rates. So. Where do you see as being signals, signs of the time that we are reaching the end of that of that game and that things are about to, to shift in a big way? Well, in a lot of ways, we're kind of like Wiley Coyote. You know, we're already off the cliff. We just haven't looked down to see that we're going to fall. We're just spinning our wheels here. But, I mean, you know, traditionally in the bond market, you have these people called bond vigilantes, and they're the policemen of the bond market. So the reason why the bond market has always worked is that if you have poor fiscal policy uh, or if you have uh, sloppy central bank uh, money printing, then what happens is people, the people who buy bonds, whether that be foreigners or domestic investors, will look at the potential inflation coming down the pike and they'll say, well, wait a minute, you know, my bonds are going to go down in value when all this money comes streaming online. And, uh, you know, that that's very, very dangerous for me. So I'm going to sell now and that presses up interest rates. Now, we're in a situation where the reason why the interest rates aren't rising is because the people who are buying bonds are the central banks themselves. So they're invest the, the bond vigilante is dead. The buyer of last resort is the Federal Reserve. They're buying government bonds, pushing down interest rates. Well, that's essentially money printing. So that's pretty much traditionally been the end of the line. That's game over. But, you know, this is a very old system. It's gone on for a long time. Like you said, there's confidence in it. But we're starting to see the bond market roll over. Now it's approaching some very, very important uh, trend lines and resistance points uh, in the 30-year, 10-year, even in the five- and two-year notes. And if we see these break down, you know, we had some serious bear markets in bonds, one in 1994, one in 2000. And a serious bear market in bonds right now would ratchet up uh, interest rates, and that could be – the trigger that could be one of the triggers. Uh, another trigger could be uh, foreign investors and uh, them changing their investment patterns. Whether that's Saudi Arabia, China, Japan, uh, they still seem to be kind of in the pocket. But there could be any number of political situations that changes that scenario. So there's a lot of things that could be potential black swans. And uh, we just don't know. We're kind of in a holding pattern here because we've got President-elect Trump, and you know it's not really in his interest to show his hand, so to speak, if he's not in power. I mean, he seems to be hinting at some things, but we don't really know what he meant when he said drain the swamp. We don't really know what he's going to do if he's going to enact serious tariffs. Uh, a trade war, that could be another trigger. Uh, we probably won't know. If he's smart, he's not going to let us know what he's going to do until he's in power because obviously people are going to try to counteract that before he does it. So we're kind of in a holding pattern here waiting for his inauguration, and then we'll probably see some pretty serious changes. There may be some triggers there. Uh, again, Jim Records uh, quote today talking about an invisible confidence boundary is eventually crossed, and it's hard to predict it before it happens. But when you mentioned something about the bond uh, people, uh, bonds passing some significant trend lines, and if it's crossed, then it could start a bear market in bonds. It sounds like what you're saying is real people making real decisions about about avoiding an intolerable risk uh is that what you're talking about is that because if if the if right now the bonds are being sopped up by the the feds just the right hand handing over the left hand putting them in the other pocket then there's no rationality to that other than just self-preservation but uh 
but are you saying that there that there'll be a real real uh, people making real decisions that are going to finally wise up and and uh, break ranks and uh, that could throw the bond market into a kilter? Well, I don't know what the percentage breakdown is as far as who is actually uh, selling these bonds, whether you know it's the Fed not buying, it's foreigners, private parties. All I can do is look at the technicals on the chart and tell you that uh, the bond market across the spectrum is looking at a pretty serious technical breakdown right now. And, and uh, that just means, uh, you know, traditional technicals tell you that we don't know why it's happening. We'll find out later what happened. But all we know is that it's going down sell. And, uh, you know, with bonds, you have to remember that it's a double whammy because uh, bonds also have that asset value. So when the bond market is going up, interest rates are going down, but the value of the bonds are increasing. So the value of the portfolio that holds bonds is increasing, whether that's a hedge fund or anything else. When the bond market falls, um, you have a deflationary effect there where those portfolios are worth less. Uh, and you also have interest rates spiking at the same time. So I'm not sure what who the buyers are or the sellers are, but whoever they are, they're getting precariously close to a technical sell signal. And there's a lot of people who follow those technicals and they will be piling on if we get a, a breakout to the downside. When interest rates would spike in that kind of a scenario, what does that do to uh, sovereign debt? I mean, to, to the country, what does that what does that do to us as a nation? Well, it absolutely explodes. I mean, it becomes, like I said before, it becomes a percentage of the the budget that's so high that it ends up eating most of the tax revenues. I mean, with a $20 trillion debt at 10% interest rates, people think, well, 10%, that's ridiculous. Well, interest rates hit almost 20% under Volcker in 1981 and 82. So it's not unthinkable. And a 10% interest rate is... Uh, that's $2 trillion per year in interest payments on that debt. That's more than two thirds of tax revenues. And so that's game over at 10% interest rates. Now we don't know what 5% would have an impact as, but you know, any serious interest rate increases is going to put a big strain on uh, Washington, which they've avoided for a very long time with the cooperation of the Federal Reserve. Well, Brother John F., uh, these were the main questions we wanted to make sure and hit with you tonight. Do you have any other final thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers before we uh, sign off? Well, I'd just like to encourage people to check out physical silver and gold, uh, check out cryptocurrencies, learn about them, because these are really the only things that are outside of the system. Um, I've already made my decision you know, I'm pretty much 90 something high percent out of their system. And uh, if they collapse it, well, so be it. I think the best way to protect yourself is to begin to function as if it's inevitability and start to think of it as if it's already happened, what you would do, go through the scenarios, uh, think about how it would impact all of your investments, all your finances, and just plan for it because there's a big sovereign crisis coming here. You know, that's the same uh, uh, theme that, again, Jim Rickards was echoing today. He, he's got a book out uh, uh, called about the coming uh, the coming collapse. And uh, he talked about, and it's funny because other guests of ours, whether it was uh, uh, Gregory Manorino talking about bet against the debt, whether it's Ann Barnhart saying get out, get out, get out, um, people talking about doing what you can to opt out of the banking system because you will lose your power to, uh, to take care of yourself and your family and your business if you remain vulnerable and subject to that um, it's it's a sobering message and uh, and uh, one that we appreciate you helping us to, to navigate a, a more clear understanding of uh, brother John F again remind people what they'll find if they come to your your website sure they can come to brother John F.com silver for the people that's our free public blog uh, it's an alternative news site not a fake news site alternative news site and uh, we maintain that uh, just to 
keep people informed about what's going on in the alternative precious metal, cryptocurrency, et cetera, et cetera, communities. Or uh, we have a member site, which is brotherjohnf.biz, and they can sign up for a monthly membership or a yearly membership at that site. Well, Brother John F., founder of brotherjohnf.com, Silver for the People, thank you very much once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thanks again for having me, Duncan.